invite you to stand with us if you'd like to right now. And uh, let's just thank the Lord for us being in this place this morning and him bringing us together and not having a clue what he's going to do, but trusting that whatever he has planned is exactly what we need. So, Father God, we come and we stand here before you. Glad to be in your presence. Knowing that in the power, in the presence of you, in your power, that the enemy does not have a chance. That in your presence, walls will fall. In your presence, our lives will be completely changed from darkness to light. Knowing that when your church stands before you because of relationship, we know that you are worthy. Because of relationship, we know that we are forgiven. So, Father, we stand and we kneel, we sit, we pray, we sing because of how glorious you are. In honor of you, Father, on this day, we pray, we sing, we listen and do your word. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church says, let's sing. We taught you all a new song last week. Let's do it now. I think we'll be able to sing it out a little louder. Not that y'all didn't sing out loud. When you know something, you let it go more. Use this as a weapon against the enemy. Here we go. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are. We, we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let it rise. The praise is rise, praise arise. We'll see you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up with all creation cry. song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be a song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see him. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive. Breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him up. With all creation, cry, God, we pray. Living heaven must sound like. Here we go. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Sing it. This is what. Come on. This is what freedom. This is what. Come on, let's raise the roof. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. 
continue to go uh, Lee um, these songs are so powerful nothing can come against him if it does it will fail it's all about his power same with me weapon may be formed but it won't prosper and when the darkness falls it won't breathe Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph And my God will never fail Oh, my God will never fail Declare it I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs
turn it for good, turn it for good, I can trust in you, Lord, you take what the enemy meant for me, and you turn it for good, you might have gone through something this week, that makes it so much more powerful than this, but you take what the enemy meant for me, and you turn it for good, you turn it salvation for we are not promised tomorrow we only know about this moment right here so father we stand here are many different people but each one you know so well you know each one of our names in this room you know our thoughts you know where we will be if you give us more time. You know where we'll be tomorrow. You know where we'll be in an hour and a half. You know. But Father, we don't. So I pray on this day that we would live it like it is our last. Not in fear, but in victory as your church. Testifying to who you are. You are so good. Thank you for this moment right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So if this is your first time at Harmony Hill, uh, we are so glad that you're here. We'd like for you to just take a moment, look in the back of this, the seat in front of you. The, there should be a little pouch just like every other seat or so. Just pull out that long card. It's called our connection card and a pencil. Sometimes in, during the service, fill it out and then place it in the offering bags when you're leaving this room. And then in the next room, uh, we have information desk and we have some great people standing back there just ready to tell you what's going on this week and uh, life groups we want you to get connected um, building community in fellowship with a group that maybe you'll you can share with and maybe if you're sick they'll bring you some good food there's a lot of positives to it like I would say, every one of them are positive. Let's continue as Lindsay leads us in this next, being thankful for what he has done.
Grace is abundant, Father God. As your pastor, Pastor John, preaches this morning, I pray that as he preaches and teaches your word, Father God, we would not only hear it, but we would live it out through this day. And if you give us tomorrow, tomorrow, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church says, you may be seated. Let the children come, and we will be obedient to God. Let the children come, and we will disciple them. Let the children come, and we will make room for them. Let the children come. Why? So that they can meet Jesus. Morning, everybody. Welcome to the Hilts. Good to have all of you guys here this morning. Uh, if you watch the screen, we just want to talk a little bit more about uh, the children's ministry here on the Hill. And uh, of course, you see a, a lot of construction going on out here. Um, the rain's kind of holding us back a little bit, but we expect that in the winter time. But progress is being made. Some concrete's been poured around the student ministry building to help our kids get in and out without uh, being in so much mud. But if you watch the screen, we want to share something with you about children's ministry. Volunteers come each week to Kids on the Hill to be able to serve the families here. Some serve once a month, some of them once a week, some because there is a need. Others do it because they just love children. Some serve because they want to invest in the future. Some are called. Although each have different reasons why they serve, the common denominator is they're all serving. They're doing it faithfully, they do it lovingly with these kids, and they do it from a willing heart because they can and they will. Every ministry here on the hill needs people. You've been called here. If you're called to the hill, this is where God, you know God wants you to be, then you're here to be connected so that you can be committed. Called, connected, committed. Your smile, your hello, just your presence can mean a lot. And so we hope you'll find your place. And our question is, will you do that? Find your place here on the hill so that you can become part of our family here as well. Now, let me just also share with you, if you notice inside your uh, Sunday bulletin, uh, there's an announcement about the uh, security team. We get asked from time to time, um, is there a security team here on the Hill? And the answer to that question, although we don't talk about it a lot, is yes, that there is. And if you're interested, you'd like to be part of our security team. If you'll notice, there's going to be an uh, informational meeting. It will be held one week from tomorrow. So that's going to be March the 2nd. That's a week from tomorrow. March the 2nd, it'll be at 6 o'clock, and it'll be down here at what we call our Harmony House, down here on Harmony Hill Drive. So that's in your Sunday bulletin. You've got it there in front of you, and that'll be a good reminder. So if you want to be a part of it, you want to find out what it's about, then we encourage you to show up next Monday evening at 6 o'clock at the Harmony House. All right. If you will, look inside your Sunday bulletin and pull out your Life Point outline if you haven't already done that. I get the privilege to be back uh, in the pulpit today after Pastor John preached last week. And you remember, he was in the book of Habakkuk. What we're doing is we're looking at what the Bible teaches us about salvation. And this week and then next week, next couple of weeks, we're looking at what, is, what does salvation look like in the Old Testament what does it look like in the New Testament? And is it different or is it the same? 
And so last week, saving faith in the Old Testament, we saw it in the book of Habakkuk. And the last part, only three chapters in Habakkuk, but the last part of chapter 3, uh, of course, Habakkuk was having a challenge uh, because things were going on that he didn't understand why God would be doing that. It just didn't make sense to him. But in chapter 3, he comes to a place in his struggle in all of this, and he just kind of sums it all up. And it's in the last two or three verses of that chapter, which you can look at a little bit later on. And what he said was, even if there's no cattle in the stall, if all of our cows are taken, our support of livelihood, and though the olive leaf fails, in other words, we don't, we don't have any hope of reaping a crop or anything like that. He said, yet I will trust in the Lord. And all of that, though all my life, I will trust him. I will trust him. Now, what we want to do is we want to see if that uh, is salvation the same in the New Testament as it is in the Old. So we're talking. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, now watch this, many believed in his name. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that they believed in who Jesus was, it, believing that he was the Messiah. This is the one that we had, Jesus said, they believe in me. But then he says this, but Jesus knew their faith. They believe he was the one that God sent to be a help to them. Yes. Were they st- that's what, that's the point God is wanting to make. God, they believed for he knew all men and man. Now, if you want to write down what that means is, it just simply means Jesus had no faith in their faith. He had no faith in their faith. He didn't believe. Was it making a difference in their life? No. And here's the truth in your life point outline. They believed he was the Messiah, but they didn't surrender their souls to his lordship. They believed he was who he said he was, but not to the point that they were willing to turn from their sin. They were not broken over their condition before God. There was no awareness that something was innately via quail. Jesus didn't say that. I said that. But that's, that's why they're just like, they're gone. They just go out. Why? Because when Jesus was talking about discipleship, will you do what I t- ask you to do? Are you going to turn from your sinful ways? Are you going to say yes to me and my will and my plan for your life? Because I made you for something. Will you say yes to me or will you say no? And Jesus knew they would, every one of them say, no, I'm not going to do that. Now look at the question. The question is, how do we know that the faith that we have is saving faith? I mean, how do you know that? And that's a great question. How do you know that the faith that you have is the faith that when you close your eyes in death in this world, you're going to go to heaven? You'll open them in heaven. How do you know that? How do you know the faith that you profess is going to get you there? Well, let me just break this down. I got two or three main thoughts. Number one, in your life point outline, let me talk about the assurance that we get from an old favorite hymn. Um, I, just, I want to start there. When I grew up in South Arkansas, Garrett Memorial Baptist Church, uh, there in Hope, one of the songs that we sang all the time was Charlotte Elliott's hymn that was uh, penned back in the 1800s. It was entitled, Just As I Am. How many of you know that song? You know that one? I mean, good grief. If you've got any kind of church background, for the most part, if you've gone to Baptist, Methodist, whatever, you know, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Right? All right. So those, were, those words, that's scriptural. I mean, that's, that's biblical. In God's word, there is this repeated call For those of us who are away from him, there's this call, come. The Bible says, come to Christ. He who shed his blood for you, come to him. 
Uh, now, how does somebody come? When we come to the Lord, how do we come? According to the hymn, we come how? Just as we are. If I want to come to Christ, that's how I come. I come just as I am. That's what it means. So look at the next truth. Sinners come to Christ on the basis of faith alone. They are to come and he will save them. So just think about John 3, 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, that's, that's biblical. And then the Lord comes back with this promise. This is in John 6, 37. The Gospel of John 6, 37. Him that comes to me, him that comes to me, I will under no circumstances cast out. Now, what I'm interested in is, what does that mean? What does it mean when, we, when Jesus says, he that comes to me, I will not cast out. Eliot's hymn said <clears throat> that sinners who want to come can come. And you are to come just as you are. How do we come? We come to him. I don't come to a church. I don't come to a preacher. I come to Christ. And I yield. I yield to him. I, to whatever he wants. And I swear allegiance to to him. Now, why do I do that? Now, don't you understand? Because this is what the Bible teaches. My faith, when I, listen, when I come to faith in Christ, that faith will be tested. And God does that so that we will understand our real condition. God does it lovingly. It hurts. It's challenging. But he does it because he loves us. He wants us to know. And so my faith and your faith will be tested. For what? For realness. Is it genuine? How will God test our faith? Listen to me, because we don't understand God sometimes. God will test my faith by allowing me at times to go through suffering. Sometimes I will go through things that are really painful on this broken earth that I live on. And I will suffer. And it may not even make sense to me. I will be called upon by the Holy Spirit in my heart. I will know God is calling on me to yield. To what? To, whatever, to what I want to do. He will call me to yield to what I want to do and to obey him. And at times, he will call on me to obey him and he will not explain himself. He will not tell me why. He will not tell me why I'm going through what I'm going through. He will not explain to me why I'm suffering. He will not un, uh, help me understand why I lose something that's important to me. He won't do it. Why does he do it? To test me. To test me. All through my life and your life, ladies and gentlemen, we will relive the Garden of Eden all over again. Where Adam and Eve were told, do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because I said to because I said to, will you obey me? You see, that's the issue between us and the Almighty. Will you obey me? Why? Because I am God. I made you. I've got a plan for you. If this is not arbitrary, it is will you honor me as God? That's what's important to him. And so we get tested in that. Which brings me to thought number two. Corruption of the gospel in our day. Now that's, I've shared with you what the gospel really means. But there's a corruption to it. And I want you to understand this. In denominations today and in churches across the American landscape, Eliot's hymn has really been kind of twisted. And I want you to understand that. Uh, sinners today, men and women, and when I say sinners, I mean we all sin from time to time. But when people who, who sin are hearing not only that Christ will receive them, just as they are, but they're also being taught that even if there is no change in their life, everything is okay because they ask God to save them. And that's what people are hearing. And what I want you to know is it's not biblical. It isn't biblical. It's not the Word of God. Do we come to faith? Do we come to Christ by faith? Yes. 
Do I live for him by faith? Yes. Is faith that's all required? No. Faith shows itself by my works. That's how I prove that I really believe. So there's this idea, and you can get it just depending on who you're sitting under and and listening to, that somebody can come to faith in Christ, ask forgiveness, believing Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he, he died so that I can have heaven, And then they come away believing, even if my life doesn't change, everything is all right between me and God. Why? Because I walk the aisle back there. I've been baptized. I'm a member of a church. Everything is okay with me. And there is no connection between my profession and the way my life is being lived. And that's not biblical. Not that they they encourage sin these pastors, these teachers, they don't mean to do that. But they are not preaching the word the way that it is. All people will say all that's biblically required is all you got to do is believe. But the Bible talks about more. It talks about the evidence of that belief. You remember Zacchaeus? You remember the story of Zacchaeus? Remember that? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. What? And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Lord passed by that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today, right? You remember that? Oh, I didn't think I'd get through that. I didn't say that first service. That's just fresh. Uh, And so (laughs) the thing was, Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, right? He has a meal with him. And when the meal is done, after Zacchaeus has had time with Jesus, then he says to the Lord, he says, Lord, if I have hurt anybody, if I have defrauded anyone, I will pay them back fourfold. And what did Jesus say? He said, today salvation has come to this house. Why? Because Zacchaeus not only believed, it changed his life. Does that make sense? Huh? He said, not only do I believe you, I'm going to undo some stuff I've done. He began living a different life. And that's, that's what the Lord is talking about. So here's the insight in your outline. Intellectual agreement to the gospel alone without a turning from a habitual life of sin isn't biblical salvation. Notice I said habitual life of sin. All of us mess up. All of us sin. I'm talking about a pattern of sin. That it doesn't, it doesn't stop. There's no breaking of it. It is a pattern of my life. That is not biblical salvation. You probably heard of a guy named Martin Luther. Uh, came out of Roman Catholicism, was a priest there. Um, of course, Catholicism is very strong on works-based salvation. Uh, salvation is in the church. Uh, that's the power that Roman Catholicism has on people that if you don't do what we tell you to do, we'll ostracize you from the church. And of course, that means that you're not saved. We won't let you take the Lord's Supper, and you've got to take the Lord's Supper in order. It has saving efficacy uh, in it. Uh, for you to be saved and to be born again, totally unscriptural. There is not one biblical verse that supports that position at all. And yet that is the power that hangs on to them. And Martin Luther came out and he broke from that, wrote his 95 theses on Wittenberg door. And Martin Luther said, the truth of scripture is that we are saved by faith. But he comes back and he says, however, that being said, works are a part of that. He never wavered in his insistence that works validate the faith. He said, I am saved by faith in Christ alone. It's not the church. It's not baptism. It is not the Lord's Supper. It is faith in Christ alone. He said, however, that faith will evidence itself by the life of that a man or woman lives. Does that make sense? That's biblical. Martin Luther was biblical in that. And that's what James chapter 2 verse 17, ladies and gentlemen, means, where James said, faith without works is what? Dead. 
What does that mean? It means it's dead. It means it's not alive. It's not, it, it's not any good. So here's the truth in your outline. There is a false faith, and the mark of it is it's a faith that ultimately changes nothing in our life. Nothing changes. What I'm saying is, when, listen, when biblical New Testament faith is the same as it was in the Old Testament. And Habakkuk said, though I don't understand what's going on in my life, I will serve him, I'll follow him, I'll do what, I, I, will, I will serve the Lord. And in the New Testament, salvation simply means I will live a life that honors God. If I really belong to him, I will live a life that brings honor to him. False faith makes a lot of great claims, but there's no life change. We still do the same things that we've all done. And that's what I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 is an example of false faith. What did, what did Peter say? He said, the, it has happened to them like the old proverb, the dog returns to his vomit and the sow washed to wallowing in her mire. And so God is simply saying there are people who will make a profession of faith and they will say, I've trusted Christ, I belong to him, and they'll turn right around and they'll go back into the same life that they've always been living and nothing changes. And he said, that is the example. That is not real. And so whenever you hear somebody say, well, if I believe like you Baptists, I just, I can trust Christ and I can go out and live any way that I want to. You're like, that is not true. That is not biblical. Amen? Amen? That is not biblical. And any Baptist church teaches that is not true to its Baptist heritage. That is a lie. And that is not an example of saving faith. We do not believe that. Do we believe in security? Yes. And security shows itself by a changed life. You are different. I mean, I'm not perfect, but by the Lord's name, I am not what I used to be. I am different. And if I'm not different, it's because nothing happened. Did I walk the aisle? Yes. Have I been baptized? A bunch of times. But it never did anything. Why? Because I never made it to Christ. Something is wrong. There are countless pastors and teachers today who say, all you got to do is believe. This intellectual agreement but they will say that the gospel doesn't demand a changed life. Even if the life doesn't change, if you believe and you trusted Christ, you're okay. So if you came to faith in Christ back there as a little kid, seven years of age in uh, kindergarten or in uh, vacation Bible school, and you're out here as an adult, and you're going from one sexual partner to the other, and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you're living a life of debauchery and everything, and something happens to you, and you die in a car wreck, or you kill your, yourself, everybody holds on, well, back when they were seven years old, they walked the aisle, and they made a profession of faith in Christ. There is no security in that, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because it never showed itself here. Are we talking about perfection? No. No. But are we talking about evidence of a change? Yes. Yes. If it's real, there's got to be a change. Um, I'm gonna just, let me just share this with you. A lot of Baptist churches, you will see um, invitations given. And a pastor may stand and uh, you'll, you'll sing that, that invitation song again and again and again and again. And maybe you're standing there saying, somebody give us some relief. Let's shut this baby down. Nobody's coming. And it was a, well, one more verse. We're going to sing one more time, right? Maybe you've been there. What are we trying to do? We're trying to do like Charles Finney. Charles Finney lived during the time when Miss Elliot wrote Just As I Am. And Finney uh, was in, in the Methodist background he was an upstate, or upstate New York attorney. He had no formal theological training of any kind. He was skilled. He had a, a hugely logical mind, very intelligent. He was truly born again in 1821, became an evangelist and a revivalist. Now, here's the insight I want you to see in your outline. Finney believed theologically that salvation was a result of a human choice. In other words, Finney believed that men were not totally at their heart depraved. He did not believe in total depravity. 
He believed that men could make a decision on their own. All they needed was to be under the right influence, have the right uh, things happen around them, and they could make a decision. Although the Bible says that Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whosoever will may come, yes, but I will not come. You will not come unless God draws you. He awakens you and pulls you to himself. That's scriptural. Finney believed that since a man could decide for Christ on his own, all you needed to do was bring some influence to bear on him. And so that's where you see um, Baptist preachers, myself included, have historically in the past, will tell heart-wrenching stories. Why? Truly from our heart, trying to reach somebody's heart, trying to reach them trying to get them to break down and to get them down that aisle to make that profession of faith. And actually, many times, it's manipulation. And here's the insight in your outline. Finney began to call people in an invitation time to what he called the anxious bench. It came to be known in Methodist circles as the altar. We call it the same thing here in the Baptist church. We call people forward, you know, come, come to the altar. Finney was very successful in getting people to move getting people to make professions of faith in the Lord, follow him in baptism. Here's historically what I learned. James Boyle, who was a fellow pastor along with, with Finney, wrote a letter to Charles Finney dated December 25th, 1834. This is a letter that was saved, and here's an excerpt from it. Listen to what he said. He said, he said let us look over the fields where you and others and myself have labored as revival ministers, and what is, what is now their moral state? What was their state within three months after we left them? I have visited and revisited many of these fields and groaned in my spirit to see the sad, frigid, carnal, contentious state into which the churches had fallen and fallen very soon after we first departed from among them. So here's the truth in your outline. It isn't Bible preaching to ask people only to believe the facts of the gospel. We, don't, we only call them to believe we also call them to surrender your life. That's what it means. It means we surrender to him. Let me, let me just let you hear how Jesus gave it. Let me give you one of Jesus' invitations. All right, listen. It's in Luke 14, verse 25. Great multitudes were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them. All right, he's going to give an invitation. Listen, to, this is the Lord's invitation. If anyone comes to me, and doesn't hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's an invitation. That's his invitation. What does he say? If you don't, if your love for me doesn't almost make your love for your mom and dad and your brothers and your sisters and even your own children almost like you hate them, you can't be my disciple. Now, was he calling on people to hate their family? No. But what he was saying was, if you really belong, if you want to come to me, that means I become Lord of your life. Why? Because I know why I created you. I know why I formed you in your mother's womb. God has a plan for your life, and it's a good one. And the Lord says, I know why I made you. And if you want to come to me, if you want to be saved, if you want to live with me in heaven, give your life to me. And that means you surrender to me. Lord, I'll follow you. What do you want me to do? And we say yes to him, whatever it is. Because he may want me to turn from this, this job at this particular place because he wants me here. He may want me living someplace else. He may want me doing something else. He may be telling you, this job you're in doesn't honor me, and I want you out. And what he simply says, are you willing to follow me? That's what being saved and born again really means. And that's why in John 2, Jesus said he saw what was in their heart. And even though they believed he was who he said he was, Jesus said, I will not commit myself to them because their heart's not right with me. 
They won't follow me. They don't, they're not willing to yield to me. And what God is saying is, beloved, is that there are people who make a profession of faith in Christ, but they don't stay. They don't stay. They don't keep with their walk with the Lord. And look at the insight in your outline. There are always professors who stay for a while but disappear. Why? Because it wasn't real. It wasn't real. In John 15, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. So what he's saying is, a grapevine will not produce grapes unless it stays hooked to the vine. Why? Because the vine is where all the life is, right? You cut the branch off, it withers and dies. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears a lot of fruit. But apart from me, you don't do anything. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch. He dries up and they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. Real faith will produce fruit. If I'm really born again, it's going to show itself. I don't talk about my faith in the past. Well, I joined the church when I was a kid. Great. What difference does it make today? What is it doing today? Because if there doesn't do anything today, it's not what? Real. Where's, where's the security in that? So the truth in your outline, there is a faith that doesn't save, and it's the faith that fails. You call it a Judas faith, if you will. Colossians 1.21 and though you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet Christ has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through his death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. In other words, he saved you. Listen, and you are saved if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and never moved away from the hope of the gospel. Here's the truth I want you to see. The implication is clear that if we move away and we don't continue in the faith, we never were truly saved. We didn't lose our salvation. We never had it. You don't lose your salvation. The truth and the next truth, the identifying mark of true faith is perseverance. Consider it all joy, my brethren, James 1 verse 2, when you encounter various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. What does that mean? It means that when trials come, they prove you are the real deal. And so when people say, what I'm going through doesn't make sense. It's not right that I'm going through what I'm going through. God has deserted me. And they walk out of the, the church. They walk out of their faith. They say, I don't believe anymore. It isn't that they lost it. They never had it. Why? Because Habakkuk is, though there's no cattle in the stalls and there's no fruit on the vine, yet will I trust him. Does it mean I don't struggle? Oh, no, it doesn't mean that. I do struggle. And there are times it gets really dark and it gets bleak and it gets black. Why? Because it doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Do I get angry? Yes. Do I not want to look at my Bible? Yes. Because it doesn't make sense. But can I turn away and say, I don't want anything to do with it? I can't. There's something that will not let me turn away. Why? Because he's in me. Do I hurt? Do I want him to explain? Yes. But because he's in me, 
I come to the place to where I say, Father, I don't understand, but I need you, and I can't leave. And though I may have more tears than I have joy, I don't walk away. Where am I going to go? I can't live without him. He's everything. What are the identifying marks, lastly? I'll give them to you, just one, two, three. Number one, the identifying marks of true faith is it's a gift from God. It comes from above. No one can come to me, Jesus said, except the Father draw him. It's not me. It's God working in me and in you. Number two, the real thing is permanent. It's not here today and gone tomorrow. A righteous man will live by faith because faith cannot die. Does it get weak? Yes. Does it quit? No. It will not quit because it's real. Number three, saving faith is obedient. For it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. One last verse, 1 Peter 2 verse 7. To those who believe, Christ is precious. To a real Christian, Christ is what? Precious. He's precious. I can't leave. Do I understand what he's doing? No. No, I don't. Do I hurt? I feel like I'm going to die because of what I'm going through. Because I'm in a broken world and God, for whatever reason, did not protect me from this pain. Do I understand it? I don't. I don't understand it. Am I going to quit? I can't. I can't. Why? He's everything. He's everything. Where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? There's no other place to go. He's God. And he made me. And I am connected to him. I can't leave. I can't. Because he's mine and I'm his. So, Father, thank you this morning for the word. As we get ready to leave this house of worship and the word, God, thank you for scripture that is like an anchor for our soul. There are a lot of things we don't understand. But one thing that hangs true, Father, is that you are in us and we're in you. We're hooked to the vine in Jesus Christ. By faith, we've been grafted in. You've connected us to yourself. And your life flows through us. It is not what we did. It is what you did for us. It has changed us forever. And I pray for any man or woman this morning who has been fooling themselves to believe a lie. Their life lacks the identifying mark of fruit. Their life doesn't produce good works for Jesus' sake. But the only thing they have is going back to some event in the past, and that's all they have. And so, God, I pray today that no one will be able to rest for whom this is true until they make it right with you. And they truly bow in their heart, and it begins to show itself externally. May there be shown a breaking from sin. We're not controlled by it, though it is, it is present. But there's been a break. We love you, Father. We pray as we leave this morning, we bring our offerings, our gifts, that your work may prosper on this earth and do what you want us to do here on the hill. Bless us as we build this building for kids. Help us to reach out to families who are outside the fold of Christ to make them welcome here and to help them understand the gospel so that you can save them and draw them to yourself. We pray this now in Christ's precious name. 
Amen. Watch the screen and then you're dismissed. Our high school and middle school students are teaming up with Mission Arlington for a chance to serve a community during spring break. For more info and registration, visit thehill.life. There will be a VBS volunteer meeting Sunday, March 1st at 3 p.m. in the Treehouse. This meeting is for any adult wanting to volunteer this year. VBS will be July 27th through the 31st. Journey to Honduras with Harmony Hill Missions and Compassion International during the summer of 2020. To get more information and to register, visit thehill.life. Every dollar in the missions box this month helps Compassion International release children from poverty in Jesus' name. Compassion partners with local churches to blend physical, social,